the Car Corner. My name is Richard Saxton. I'm the coordinator of the automotive programs here at the Community College of Philadelphia. In today's episode, you're going to see Dan Reed get you fired up about his discussion on starters. If you have any questions about the automotive programs, please check us out at the website. Okay, now it's time to get it in gear. Hi, I'm Dan Reed with the Community College of Philadelphia's Automotive Technology Program. Welcome to Car Corner. Today, we're going to be talking about electric starter motors. Now, you first may be curious why I even called it an electric starting motor and not just a starter motor in a car. And the truth is, at one time, cars did not have electric starters. You had to actually put a crank into the front of the engine, and then you actually had to turn that crank, and you had to manually crank the car over, and uh, that was attached to the crankshaft of the car. And in turn, once the car got enough momentum, once you developed enough compression with your arm and your hand, the car would actually start as long as you had uh, the fuel set and the ignition set. And it was a very, very difficult process. It was so difficult, in fact, that people would get very aggravated trying to start their car by cranking it, that it led to the term cranky, as in, oh, I think the baby's cranky, the baby's upset. That term did not exist until we had people trying to hand crank a car. The other thing that it led to was that this crank sticking out of the front of the engine was attached to the engine, and while there was a one-way gearbox on it, there were times where the crank would actually kick back. The crank would actually kick back as you were trying to crank forward, and your arm would possibly fly off the crank, and the crank would come back and possibly hit you in the chest. It was not uncommon for people to break arms, break their chest, break their ribs, and that led to the term fly off the handle. If you fly off the handle and the handle comes back and breaks your ribs, you're pretty upset, in which case you flew off the handle and you're upset. This became such a big problem in the, 19, in the early 1900s that Henry Leyland, uh, head of the Cadillac Motor Car Company, had a friend of his actually killed trying to start a car by hand cranking. What happened was uh, Henry Leyland's friend stopped to help a woman whose car had stalled out on a bridge. The woman did not have the arm strength to actually restart the car, and she was tired from trying to do it. So Henry's friend jumped out to try to help her. In the process of Henry's friend trying to crank the car, the crank spun back, struck his friend in the jaw, and immediately broke his neck, in which case Henry's friend died. Henry was so horrified that this happened while somebody was trying to start a car, he said, from now on, if anybody buys a Cadillac, I do not want them to die trying to start my car. And he worked closely with a man by the name of Charles Kettering. Charles Kettering is a well-known automotive inventor and engineer, and Charles Kettering helped create the electric starter motor, which basically got rid of the crank. Once Charles Kettering developed the electric starter motor, Henry Leland was so impressed with his invention it became standard equipment, and Cadillacs since 1912 were the first car to come with a standard electric starter. So that gives you a little bit of the history of, of how automobiles now just have electric starters. Before that, it was obviously quite difficult to get your car started. So the electric starter, how does electricity help me start my car? Well, it's got an electric motor, but how does that electric motor work? What a lot of people don't realize is that there's a close relationship between electricity and magnetism. And I'm going to demonstrate some of that here in a, in a minute. First of all, we have a component called an armature. And an armature is a winding, a coil of wire. And what you have to understand about a coil of wire is that when we pass a current through it, it generates a magnetic field. Now that magnetic field is just like the regular magnets on your refrigerator they have this natural attraction to items that contain iron or ferrous metal. So we actually use this coil of wire inside the motor to generate a magnetic field. Now normally, when we have a magnetic field and a coil of wire, what we can do is we can wrap that wire around any type of metallic core. The core has to have iron in it. And so we call that uh, a ferrous metal, ferrous being the uh, um, the term for iron. 
the symbol on the periodic table for iron is Fe, so that's a ferrous metal. And um, what we're able to do with this is if I take a battery here and I apply voltage to this coil of wire, to the two ends of this wire, this coil will actually create a magnetic field and at this point it's going to induce that magnetic field into the steel core. Now the steel core right now is not magnetized. If I take this little piece of a socket extension on there, well, it is, does have a slight residual magnetic field from the last time I demoed this in class, but you'll see that it's pretty, pretty weak. And what I'm going to do is we're going to increase that magnetic field when I do give this some voltage and current and pass it through the core. Right now, this is actually magnetized. If I come over here to pick up this core, it's quite, quite magnetized. If I disconnect it, it drops it right away. And I can repeat this procedure as long as I want. Look at that. It will actually stay magnetized for a while. Now I can repeat this procedure as long as I have electric power. I have to have voltage and current traveling through that wire to create that magnetic field. So the car's battery is what delivers the electric power down to the starter motor. I can also not only uh, attract things, I can move things with that magnetic field. So if I take this coil of wire and I take a steel, uh, steel punch, I can lay this on the inside of this coil of wire. Now right now it's not doing anything, it's not moving, but if I apply voltage to this and current, what it's going to do is it's going to create a magnetic field and it's going to actually pull this steel punch inside that magnetic field. Just as if you held a magnet near a piece of metal, the magnet is going to be attracted to the metal and the metal, the iron is going to be attracted to the magnet. So let me demo that. All right, and when I turn this on, look at that. It goes right through. I can do this over and over again. In fact, if I do it fast enough, I can actually get it to bounce in the magnetic field and then throw it back out. So that shows the other cool thing about electricity and magnetism is that we can use it to actually move things when we apply voltage and current through that magnetic field. We can use that push-pull effect. Now you can imagine if I had something like a spring on this steel punch, I could actually have it always retract back as soon as I disconnected the electric field. And that, in part, is, is what makes an electric starter motor function. It's that magnetic field. So we need the voltage from the battery to create this magnetic field through a coil of wire. And then we're going to use that magnetic field to basically spin the electric motor in a circular rotation as the, uh, as the magnetic field changes. So, now that we have that out of the way, let's take a look at how the starter motor actually interacts with the engine on the car. So, the way the electric starter motor interacts with the car is interesting. We can't have this electric starter motor hooked up and actually coupled to the engine the entire time while the engine's spinning. The engine is spinning much, much faster while the car is running than the electric starter motor could, could withstand. The other thing is, is that the, the electric starter motor itself um, isn't lubricated in the same way that the, uh, the engine is. So it doesn't have a separate oil pump and an oil filter and the car has those things. The engine in the car has those things because it spins at a much higher RPM and you know, it has to withstand much more use. So the starter is actually used, you hear the starter run while you have the key turned or you push the starter button in your car. Um, and then, and then once you remove the, you know, take your hand off the ignition key or take your finger off the button, at that point the starter disengages. And the starter doesn't actually do anything until the next time you need it to restart the car. And some vehicles, uh, some race vehicles in particular, um, they actually don't have an onboard electric starter. The starter is external and the car or motorcycle is started by the pit crew. And then once the car is out on the racetrack, the starter motor is sitting back in the pit crew lounge doing nothing, just waiting for the car to come back into the pits, in which case if they turn the car off, 
they have to get the starter motor again. So going back to our how things work, um, this is a uh, flywheel inside a car. Now this would actually directly attach to the crankshaft of the engine and we're, when we take a look at removing a starter from a car, we're going to be able to see these teeth. These teeth are what's known as the ring gear of the flywheel. Um, if it's an automatic transmission, it's a component called a flex plate, but it works the same way. And these bolts around the center are where our crankshaft actually attaches to the engine. So the things like the pistons and the connecting rods and all the internal components of the engine ultimately transfer their power back down through here. And this ring gear around the outside is where we actually have the starter motor engage and contact this flywheel. Now our starter motor, you can remember I talked about the armature windings and the, the, uh, the windings of wire in the magnetic field. That has an end piece on the end or the nose of the starter. And that component is actually called, the proper term is called a Bendix. And it's called a Bendix because it was invented by the Bendix Corporation, which still exists today, which makes all kinds of uh, truck equipment. They make uh, everything from brakes for trucks to cars to railroads to industrial applications and things like that. But uh, they were one of the first manufacturers to come up with this little, uh, this little cool device here. What it is is it's a uh, spring-loaded one-way clutch. So it's easy to turn in one direction, but in the other direction, it actually locks together and causes the uh, entire armature to uh, bind to it. So what we do with this is we have our Bendix and the Bendix is located next to our flywheel. And it's very, very close in proximity to the flywheel. It's actually usually um, our starter is generally bolted to the transmission or engine case. When you engage the starter, uh, a pinion gear comes out and engages the teeth in the flywheel, at which point we start to turn our electric motor, and that's going to turn our engine. Now you may be wondering, why is there such a big difference in the size of the gears? And the reason why is that it takes a lot of energy to actually crank an engine. The way that we get that energy is that we move it through a small gear to a large gear. That gives us a gear reduction. And generally, for every one revolution that the starter turns, we're going to have about 1 20th of a rotation of our flywheel. So the ratio is about uh, 20 to 1. That gives us a lot more torque. We sacrifice speed for torque. So what happens is, is as the starter motor is spinning, um, the engine is not spinning as fast, but we are generating enough torque to actually rotate the engine. And again, going back to why we do this, um, it's hard work. It's hard work if you had to hand crank the, the engine by yourself. If you've ever had to um, possibly do that on an engine, you can actually still attach a ratchet to one end of the engine and actually hand crank the engine. It's very difficult. Um, you have to be quite strong and, or have a large lever to do it. The, um, the other thing is, is that in terms of engine power, engines today have a much higher compression ratio, which is the amount of volume of air that we actually squeeze in the cylinder. That compression ratio on old cars was extremely, extremely low. That was because you had to basically compress it by hand as you were hand cranking it. The problem with low compression engines is low compression engines have extremely low power. So if you ever are at a car museum and you see some, you know, 1920s Rolls Royce with a big, you know, 10 liter V12 or something astronomical like that, and you see that the engine only made 150 horsepower and you kind of scratch your head and say, why was that giant engine so horribly inefficient? It's because it was a low compression engine because it had still had the, the, um, the ability to actually be hand cranked. Uh, I would tend to think a Rolls Royce would probably adopt uh, an electric starter motor pretty quickly, but it was for quite some time, it was untested and if the battery died um, and you didn't have jumper cables, you still had to hand crank your engine. So it was not until we completely eliminated hand cranks that we moved away from low compression engines. Um, all right, let's take a look at some different types of starter motors and some of the basic components that actually make the rest of the starter motor work.
So what I have here is I have a cutaway of an electric starter motor. Now, again, generally starter motors are they're pretty much buried up in the engine compartment. They're, they don't fail as often as they used to. They, they do fail occasionally, so they do have to be removed for service. But if you just happen to open your hood and try to find the starter motor, it might actually be extremely difficult to see. So the starter motor casing itself, a lot of times the nose of the starter is made of aluminum and the back half of the motor is made out of steel. And then we have this component on top and this component on top is referred to as a starter solenoid. Now the starter solenoid works on that magnetic field that we showed with the punch. It actually pulls back a plunger and in the process of pulling back a plunger, what it does is it drives the spring-loaded Bendix out. So when we engage the starter, the plunger pulls back and we engage the starter out. What happens on the other side of the starter is that my flywheel assembly would be in this area right here and when I engage the starter, the starter drive pops out and engages the ring gear on attached to the, the engine on the uh, flywheel or the flex plate. When I release the key, it snaps back and it's not being used anymore. That one-way clutch is important because if I happen to accidentally leave my hand in the start position while I'm starting the car, I want to make sure that the speed of the engine doesn't burn out my starter motor, and that's where this one-way clutch comes into play. It actually allows the engine to overdrive the starter without damaging the starter. Now, on the back side, again, what we have is we can see our steel windings, or our, our uh, windings on the inside, and then we can see our armature. And what we do with an electric starter motor is that the outer winding areas here are sometimes referred to as pole shoes. And what they do is they generate a magnetic field. As we run our starter motor, the starter motor is going to rotate. As it goes through, what's going to happen is, is the armature, this component right here, the armature has individual windings on it, and as the starter starts to rotate, what happens is, is it reverses those magnetic fields. So what we do is we actually rely on the inertia of the starter motor to kind of push it towards the next magnetic field, and as it starts to get closer, we quickly reverse the magnetic field, which actually sort of flip-flops directions, and it makes the motor jump one notch. And we repeat that process over and over, so what we get is we get rotary motion out of our starter motor. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to take a battery. And I'm going to attach a ground to my starter motor. And I'm going to attach power back here to this top stud of the starter. And when I do that, nothing's going to happen yet. All right. And then I'm going to get something called a starter bypass switch. And what the starter bypass switch is going to do is, this is actually a diagnostic tool, which I'll show you how it works in, in a second. But this is a diagnostic tool that a technician would use to actually bypass the entire ignition key starter circuit. And when this switch is closed, what it does is it simulates the ignition key being turned in the start position. When you use one of these tools, you have to be extremely careful because generally there's another component farther up in the circuit called a neutral safety switch. And the neutral safety switch in most cars prevents you from starting the car if the car is accidentally left in drive or if your foot is not on the clutch. By squeezing the switch and bypassing that starter circuit, if I happen to have the ignition in the car turned on and the car is in drive, and the car is not running, and I activate the starter, the car will actually start in drive and then proceed to run you over. So you have to be extremely, extremely careful while you're working with the starter bypass switch. So I'll hook this guy up here, and I'll hook this up here, and then when I engage the starter motor, it's going to make a loud click and it's going to have a bit of torque. Oops. What happens is, is that loud clunk is the plunger pulling back. At that point, there's also a switch plate inside here that creates contact that allows the current to travel from the battery to the motor. So the solenoid also acts as a switch. 
All right, and I'll show you what happens on the other side of the starter as well. I'll flip this around and we can see right here, my starter solenoid will cause the Bendix to fly out. And pretty much that's how an electric starter motor functions when it's in the car. So let's take a look at a couple different types of electric starter motors and I'll show you how to bench test those as well. So going back to this component called the starter solenoid, the starter solenoid on a lot of different starters is actually removable and replaceable as a separate component. And if we're going to go through here and replace it, I'll show you how to remove it. Generally, there's two screws on the front side of the starter, and these screws are either just going to be bolts, or in this case, they happen to be Torx bits. And then on the back side, we see that there's some electrical connections on the starter. Now, our electrical connections on the back of the starter are very important. And what's interesting is, is that they're fairly standardized in the industry and in, in what they do and how they work. This small pin right here at the top is referred to as the S wire. And the S wire is the wire that actually receives a 12 volt electrical signal when you complete the circuit for the ignition switch that comes down. It applies voltage here. That S wire is what actually activates the coil of wire inside the starter solenoid which moves the starter solenoid. This wire right here at the top is referred to as the B wire. The B wire you have to be very, very careful about. What a lot of people don't realize about electric starter motors is that while the battery is hooked up in the car, this wire right here has full possible current and power from the battery at all times, even when the ignition key is out of the ignition. A lot of times there's a protective cap over this, which prevents you from, say, while you're changing oil, accidentally dropping a screwdriver in here and causing an electrical short. So you have to be very, 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 very careful while you're working around starter motors and realize that basically you're working with a direct connection to the battery regardless of what position the key's in. The last pin here is referred to as the M pin. And the M pin is through a braided wire and it's what actually activates our motor and our starter motor circuit. So to remove this starter solenoid, what I have to do first is I'm going to have to disconnect this M wire. Oops. And a lot of times you'll see that we have small things like washers, spring-loaded washers on the starter connections. Starter connections are very, very important, not only because they're what basically controls the amount of voltage and current that gets to the starter to start your car, but if they're loose or damaged, they'll cause high resistance, which will cause arcing and overheating, and that'll cause the connections to actually melt or burn and fail. Let me flip this around the front and we'll take out our Torx bits. And once this guy comes out, Oh, there's my starter solenoid. So this component on a lot of starters is actually replaceable from the separate starter. Now, depending on the age of the car and depending where and how you're getting it reconditioned, uh, if you're getting a rebuilt one or a new one, uh, it may not actually be available. But if we apply 12 volts to this guy, we can, we can activate it and make this pull back and we can actually verify that the starter solenoid would be good. So I'm going to take my 12 volts here for my battery pack and connect that to my S wire. And then as soon as I ground this out, it should retract. <laughs> 
And there we go. My jumper box is getting a little weak. But uh, that would be our starter solenoid in action. All right. So that's how, at this point in time, most starters, that, that, that's about the extent of the service that you could do to a starter in terms of servicing it if it was defective. What we used to be able to do uh, back several years ago was to actually dis disassemble the starter, replace the brushes, check the armature, and you know, basically overhaul the entire starter. Today, generally, that's not done, and most of the time, they, they just replace the solenoid or the starter motor or together both as a package. All right, so two other important components on starters is that some starters will have a heat shield attached to them. And the heat shield is critical for the life of the starter. A lot of times starter motors, again, because they're placed in areas that are difficult to get to underneath the car, they live in a pretty hot environment. And it's not uncommon to actually have, a lot of times, an exhaust manifold or a catalytic converter be placed very close in proximity to our electric starter motor. Now going back to the internal lubrication of the starter motor, it's not the same as the engine. And what that means is that we have to protect the starter from heat. And if you do change a starter motor and there's a heat shield on your old starter, but you don't see a new one in the starter in the box, make sure you unbolt this heat shield and attach it to the new starter. If not, there's a good chance that your new starter motor will fail prematurely due to uh, heat exposure on the back side of the uh, starter. It's basically going to fry the guts of the thing while you're driving down the road. So it will work for maybe a couple months. But as soon as it starts to get too hot, the starter is going to fail. The other thing is, is that not all starter motors on the back side use a bolt for the S-wire. A lot of times, uh, most import vehicles are going to generally use a spade connector on the S-wire. And so you have to make sure that that spade connector is firmly attached to the spade lug on the uh, starter solenoid. A lot of times it's not uncommon to actually have a car that won't start and all you really need to do is pretty much go under here and just kind of wiggle the S-wire connection around. Some manufacturers for whatever reason they put the starter in a bad area and maybe oil from the oil filter drips on it during oil changes and a lot of times it can get covered with uh, dirt and grime and debris, road salt and things like that. And sometimes just wiggling the S-wire connector is enough to actually go through and get the starter to function. The other thing that's a common failure with starters is that the starter will stick. In other words, it kind of has a hit or miss operation. And what happens is, is that carbon starts to build up on the armature windings from components called brushes. Now the brushes are what uh, allow the electrical current to pass through to the armature. And they're made out of a soft carbon type material. It's, if you were to look at it, it almost sort of looks like a formed lump of coal in the shape of a brick. It's soft and it's made to actually wear out. These brushes, as they wear, they shed the material and they create uh, this carbon buildup on the brushes. And it's not uncommon to have somebody go underneath a car with possibly a hammer and while somebody's trying to start the car to hit the starter with a hammer. Now in years past, when we had very, very large V8 vehicles in the 1970s, the starters could literally withstand the hit from a hammer. And if the car started after you smacked it with a hammer, maybe the starter solenoid was sticking or something like that, that meant you needed a starter. It didn't mean that you fixed it with a hammer. Starters today, it's generally a bad idea to hit starters with a hammer. Some of the starters internal are actually permanent magnets. They're not wire wound pole shoe magnets. And if you strike it hard enough, you'll actually break and shatter the ceramic material inside the magnet. So I generally don't recommend people whacking these things with hammers like they're trying to beat them to death. If you do want to try to gently tap the starter with a hammer, uh, with a hammer my advice is actually use the wooden end of the hammer handle and use that to kind of knock against the starter while somebody's trying to start the car. If the battery's dead, it's not going to help. But if the battery is good and you think that the starter may actually be stuck, 
there's a chance that you might get lucky and the car might start. Just be careful when you do that because it's not really what you're supposed to do. The other thing is, is it doesn't mean you fixed it. It means that you need to replace the starter as soon as possible. All right. The last type of starter is what's known as a gear reduction starter. And a gear reduction starter looks a little bit different. It's shorter and more compact. It has a starter solenoid. And on the back side, this one has a spade connection. And this is where my, uh, this is where my B wire would come in and my M wire comes around here. So it's the same style connections. The thing is, is that what it has on the front of it is a short nose and this large gear assembly. Now what the gear reduction starter allows us to do is further trade off speed of the starter motor for torque. And gear reduction starters are very common in a lot of cars. Um, I would say that probably most of the uh, import vehicles generally use a gear reduction starter, whereas your larger V8s and that type of thing don't use a type of gear reduction starter. So it, it really, you know, one starter isn't good enough for everybody. They will actually mix them up in the sense of what they, the application for the engine is for. And really, if you ever wondered why one starter doesn't sound like another starter, maybe at a parking lot and car starters sound differently, it's literally because they may actually be different types of starter. Gear reduction starters sound very different than non-gear reduction starters. Okay, let's take a look at the basic components involved in the starter motor wiring and ignition circuit. What we have here is a demonstration tool that we use here at the college to help students uh, diagnose a basic starting circuit. Uh, works great to actually explain the main components in a starting circuit. Now, we all know our friend the starter motor, but really for most people it starts with basically the ignition switch. Now the ignition switch in most vehicles has four positions. Typically we have an accessory position, which in some cars you actually pull the key back um, what that's going to allow you to do is just listen to the radio and the accessories in the vehicle. Then there's an off or lock position and then there's run. And what run does is run turns on things like the fuel system and the ignition system, but we don't actually start the car yet until you move the key to the start position. Now, I have this set up so it's going to beep when I'm in the start position, but if you look carefully at what happens to the key, when I release it from the start position, it's going to automatically spring back to the run position until I turn the car off. So if we turn this you know, on and then I go to start, that would be the starter active. And then when I release the key, it springs back to the run position, in which case the car runs until I turn the car off and take the keys out with me. So that start function, what that does is that energizes, uh, it sends electrical current to another component called the backup neutral safety switch. Now, in an automatic transmission, you may wonder, why can I only start my car in park? Well, you can start your car in park, or you can start it in neutral. Uh, the reason why we give uh, uh, manufacturers and customers the option to do that is if this switch does happen to fail in the park position, I can actually shift the car to neutral and still actually start the car. The difference between start, or I'm sorry, the difference between park and neutral is that in the park position, the transmission's locked, so the car can't roll. However, in neutral, the transmission is unlocked, so the car can roll freely, but either position allows us to start the vehicle. I don't want to be able to start the vehicle and drive, because if I did, I would accidentally hit the start button, and at that point, the car would immediately lurch into gear and start taking off. I want to be able to have the customer put their foot on the brake, take the vehicle out of park and put the vehicle into drive or reverse. So this switch is what actually prevents that current from going to the starter. If you've ever accidentally tried to start a car and drive, um, you turn the key and nothing happens, this is the switch that stops that. Now in a modern manual transmission vehicle, we don't have a park position, we have a trans, uh, manual transmission and a clutch. And on most of those cars, we replace this neutral safety switch with a physical switch on the clutch so your foot has to be fully depressed to the floor while you turn the starter in order to engage the starter motor and a manual transmission. Same exact rule applies. In old manual transmission vehicles, starting as early as 1995, which wasn't that long ago, in some vehicles you can actually have the car in gear, first gear, 
with your feet on no pedals and just turn the ignition key to the start position and the car will start and immediately go into gear and run into whatever is in front of it because your foot isn't on the brake. So we do have that switch as well on a, a manual transmission vehicle. We have another component which some vehicles have which is a, step, a separate starter relay and what the starter relay can do is maybe this is part of the anti-theft system of the car. Maybe it's part of an alarm system in the car. If the alarm car alarm goes off, the system deactivates the starter relay, which while you may have hot wired the car, you may have bypassed this equipment without having the key. If the car alarm is going off, the starter relay is going to further prevent the starter from functioning. So really, in terms of getting the starter to function, there's one, two, three switches that have to close first before we actually engage the starter motor. The last thing we have is obviously our starter motor. And we have our starter solenoid, which we're familiar with. And then we have our pins on the back side of the starter motor as well. We have our S wire, which is our signal from the ignition key and our backup safety switch. And then we have our B wire and our M wire. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to demonstrate some of the basic uh, tests that you can do to determine if the starter circuit is faulty. Now, if you remember in a, another episode, I talked all about car batteries and how important car batteries have to be charged and how to maintain them and make sure that the terminals are clean and tight. Any time that we have a vehicle that does not start, you actually start with the battery. So please, I'm just going to say right here, if your battery is even the slightest bit questionable, don't jump to the starter because the starter can't function without a properly functioning battery. The other thing is, is if the starter motor does run and the car won't quote unquote start and run on its own, it doesn't mean that the starter is defective. At that point you have a ninja performance problem like maybe a fuel injection or an actual ignition system fault. If when you turn the key to the start position and you hear the car go roo, 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 like that, that starter is functioning. Don't, don't bother replacing it. It's working just fine. Okay, so let's take a look here. When I turn my key to the run position, if my car is in park, make sure my transmission's in park, when I turn the key to the start position, this starter motor is going to function. Okay, and that's, that would be the starter motor functioning at that point. If I did have power going to the fuel and ignition system of the car, the car should fire up and run. If I have a problem with the car and it will not start, I can use a 12 volt test light right here. And what I can do with this guy is I can attach this to the ground side of my battery, which uh, I can clip here like this. And if I come over here to the top of the, uh, of the starter, if I take my test light and I touch it to the back side of the B wire, you see it lights up. And that's because this wire always is attached to the battery, like I said earlier. If we were to follow this wire back, that actually goes directly back to the battery itself. Now what you have to be very careful about again is that while we're working with starter motors, this essentially is all the potential energy that the battery has as well. In most cars it's unfused and in fact when I take the key out of the ignition and put them down there you can see that that wire still has power. That wire always has power. So anytime that we're working under the car near the starter it's a good idea to make sure you disconnect the battery. The other thing is is that my S wire right here if I had any question that my signal from my ignition switch was faulty when I go to start the car what I should get is I should get voltage here at the S wire. Now I'm going to disconnect my battery back here and I'm going to unbolt this S wire to show you what happens and how you would test it on the car. So if I unbolt the S wire, and have it out here, when I go to the start position at this point, whoops, let me turn my battery back on, the starter won't function. And it won't function because I have my S wire disconnected. Now what I can do is I can take my 12 volt test light and I can check to see that when I turn the key, do I get a light? And yes, I do. If I get a good big strong light like that, that means that this entire circuit 
the ignition switch, the neutral backup safety switch, and the starter relay, and the alarm system. That's all functioning, and it is sending a signal down here to tell the starter that it should function. To give an example, if this switch was faulty, I would turn the key and nothing would happen. That would mean I'd have to go backtrack through here, and the chances are the starter motor is okay, and the fault actually lies back here with the actual electrical circuit from the ignition key to the starter. So if I did have a problem, and I wanted to be absolutely sure that my starter motor functioned or didn't function, what I can do is I can isolate that S wire and I can use a tool like a fused jumper wire. Now this may look like a complicated piece, but really what it is, it's a 30 amp fuse and it is inside a uh, housing that I got from a local electronics store with two alligator clips. What I can do with this fused jumper wire is I can attach this from the B wire from the battery and jump it directly to the S wire and make the starter function. Now, you have to be careful. I'm going to do this without the ignition key in the, uh, in the ignition, and you're going to see that I'm going to be able to actually power the starter this way. Now, this doesn't mean that you can hot wire the car and steal the car. However, if the car is in gear um, and it's a manual transmission and you do this, the car will move in whatever gear it's in. So you have to be careful. The reason why it's not going to actually allow the car to start and run since the ignition key is out is because I don't have the, uh, the fuel and the ignition powered up in the car. But if I take my fuse jumper wire and I attach it from the B wire and I go directly to the S wire, I'm going to get a little spark here but it should run the starter motor. And if I hear that, I know that the starter motor itself is functioning. Now, going back to that earlier tool that I had, this guy, the starter bypass switch, what this allows me to do is just basically have a switch, which I could have up in the engine bay, and I could just squeeze the trigger and actually just function the starter. So again, I know at this point the starter is good. What some people do, and you have to be very, very careful if you're going to do this, in fact, we don't recommend it at all, is they will actually take a screwdriver and pass the screwdriver over the connection of the uh, B wire and touch the S terminal. What that's going to do is it's basically going to jump and simulate those two other tools that I just used. Now when you do this, you have to be very careful because the screwdriver does not have a fuse, nor is it a switch. And when I do this, I'm going to get some nice sparks, but there's a good chance that the starter will function. So again, just be careful. It's not the right thing to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around the other side and show you how this works. So now that we have a basic idea of how the electrical system functions, what I'm going to show you is over here in our Windstar, we're going to actually remove the starter. We're here underneath our Ford Windstar to pull the starter out of it. Now the starter is up here in this area. Um, again, normally most of the time the starter's kind of tucked away and I apologize if it's a little hard to see. But uh, that's, this is actually the easiest starter for us to get to and show you today. So first of all, I cannot stress enough to make sure that you have had the battery disconnected before you go to remove the starter. And the reason why is because when we go in here to disconnect our electrical power, again, that's a direct connection back to the battery. And sometimes people have the starter hang by the wiring while they're installing it and removing it. And that's a really bad idea because what will happen is, is you'll actually break these terminals off of the back of the starter and with the starter solenoid terminals broken, your starter solenoid will not function. There's no way to uh, reconnect or solder or glue or epoxy those connections back on. They're literally part of the starter solenoid. So let me get started first by removing the electrical connections off of our starter. And I'm going to first start with my B wire which goes back to the battery and reach up in here and get that out of the way. And you'll notice that my M wire 
is still connected to, the, my, to my starter. Now I don't remove this wire because it's what connects the starter solenoid directly to the starter. And uh, typically we don't have to disconnect that unless we are replacing the starter solenoid. Which incidentally, to, to replace the starter solenoid in this, I would actually have to pull the starter out anyway. It's not something that you could do typically with the starter still in the car. All right, now we can move on to the bolts that actually hold the starter in. Now the other thing is, there may be other wires attached to the bolts that actually hold the starter in. It's important to make sure that you put those wires back because what they are is they are the opposite side of the electrical circuit. They're the ground circuit and they're what actually allows the electrons a path back to the battery from the positive side. So that's the ground or negative side of the return. Now when you go to put the starter back in, if you happen to leave that wire disconnected, the starter may crank slowly or it may crank and then kind of stop. It's also going to cause all sorts of other electrical faults in relation to the engine. So you could actually have sensor faults or the engine might not run properly. It's very important to always make sure that you put all of the ground wires back. Now, I can pull these down and show you. This wire, which I just disconnected, that's my ground wire. This wire right here, which looks almost exactly identical to it, this guy right here is my positive wire to my battery. It is absolutely critical that we do not mix these up when you go to put the starter back in the vehicle. If you do, you will start a fire and possibly have the battery explode in the vehicle. So you have to remember that this is our ground. out down through here all right and there we go there's our starter out of the vehicle now again um, one of the things that is important is you can see that there's this white corrosion on the starter now that happens from road salt and uh, just corrosion. Um, steel rusts, aluminum corrodes. And we want to make sure that when we go to put our new starter back in, that we have this area cleaned up. So if I was removing this and reinstalling it, I'd make sure that this area was clean. Likewise, on the actual transmission housing, what I have, and I could pull it down here, is I have a plate which is an inspection cover. And this plate actually covers part of my torque converter assembly. And the, the starter, while the starter's in the vehicle, actually fits through the plate. The starter actually fits through the plate like that. Now this in the vehicle, when it's like this, what this plate does is this plate actually controls the depth in which the starter engages with the flywheel. Some vehicles have that plate as a selectable shim. And it's very important to make sure that the starter is aligned properly with the teeth up on the uh, flex plate or flywheel. Otherwise, you'll actually damage the starter as the car is trying to crank. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a large socket and I'm going to attach this to the end of the crankshaft of the engine on the opposite side from where I'm at. And what that's going to allow me to do is manually rotate and crank the engine like they did in the old days. And at that point, I'll be able to inspect all of the teeth on that ring gear. So as I crank the engine over, I'm able to inspect all of the teeth on the ring gear. And it takes quite a bit of effort to manually crank the engine over. I can't imagine how people in 1910 managed to do this. All right, and everything looks okay. So, let's take a look at putting it back in. Okay. So we've got our, uh, our new starter motor to go back in our Windstar.
And uh, again, I'm just going to make sure that I follow the reverse order of uh, everything I took out. I can't forget my cover plate here, so I'll put that back in first. And make sure that's up in there. And one of the other things which is important too is that since the um, since the, the casing of the starter is made of aluminum, it strips very easily. So when you go to reinstall this, you're going to want to make sure that your bolts uh, for the starter line up perfectly before you actually start to put a ratchet or a wrench on them. If you happen to cross thread this when you install it, it's going to cause some major issues because the starter won't be aligned properly and you'll actually tear the threads out of your starter which means that literally your starter could fall out while you were driving if the bolts happen to loosen up. So always make sure that we, we get these bolts started by hand and that the threads are engaged before we actually put a ratchet on them and start working. All right, so let's get started. And when I go to tighten down the S wire, I have to be careful uh, since that pin is so small on the uh, starter solenoid. I want to make sure that I don't over tighten it and snap it off. So I really have to use a light touch. on there. And then lastly, I'm going to hook up my B wire from the battery to the starter. And I have to make absolutely sure that this B wire does not contact anything it's not supposed to. If it does, it's going to either cause the starter to be on all the time even when the key's out of the ignition, or it's going to start a short and have a possible fire as soon as I hook my battery back up. All right, and they look good. So at this point, what I would do is I'd put the vehicle down, and I would reconnect the battery, and then I would make sure that my starter functioned. I'd make sure that it had good engagement and it didn't sound bad, uh, didn't, didn't sound like it was uh, grinding uh, or not meshing correctly with the uh, ring gear. And uh, we would get on down the road. I'm Dan Reed. Thanks for watching Car Corner. Drive safely. Okay. So I'll pick it up and shake it around now. <laughs> I won't move it. All right, ready? Okay. And that's the end. How's that? <laughs>